Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk. Um, so talk about vegetables. We think of vegetables as innocent, perhaps even virtuous. But they do have a dark side. And it's important to explore this other side of vegetables, because some people do have trouble with vegetables. Uh, some people do eat a paleo diet and still have symptoms such as pain or IBS symptoms, for example, which may not be completely resolved simply by changing to a paleo diet. So the first, the first thing is a definition. What is a vegetable? So a vegetable is any part of the plant which is not the fruit or the seeds or the flowers. Uh, and I would argue that the plant wants you to eat its fruit because it wants its seeds to be dispersed by you, but it does not want you to eat its body. And the vegetables are the body, the bodies of the plants. Uh, and so whenever I'm thinking about any kind of food, the first question I always want to ask is, do we really need it for anything? Uh, we know from world history that there have been cultures around the world which have survived on very low plant diets. And some people have even eaten almost no vegetables or fruits for most of the year. And so it just begs the question of whether or not vegetables are really necessary because in Eskimos in particular, we have historical information that tells us that Eskimos not only thrived and reproduced and were able to exercise without any carbohydrates or plants or fruits or vegetables, they actually uh, seem to have very low rates of cancer. And so this is interesting because um, one of the things we're told about vegetables is that they're supposed to help us in our, um, in our fight against cancer. So just as an experiment, I wanted to, to get a feel for what kinds of evidence is out there supporting vegetables and health. And so what I did was I went on PubMed, and, which is a search engine for those of you who don't know, looking for scientific articles, and um, uh, there are over 80,000 studies about vegetables, so I obviously couldn't go through all of those, uh, narrowed them down to, to uh, randomized controlled studies having to do with vegetables and health. And I used the word health because if anything, that might induce a positive bias. I was looking for evidence to support vegetables. And so unfortunately, most of these studies I, I had to eliminate uh, from, from the consideration because most of them were irrelevant to the question. The vast majority of studies about vegetables were about how to get people to eat more of them, not about whether or not they were actually healthy. So, and of the studies that remained, 18 of them were negative. The investigators were looking for health benefits from vegetables and didn't find what they were hoping to see. And as you might notice here, uh, the, another problem with vegetable studies is that the vast majority of vegetable studies are not studies of vegetables. They're studies of fruits and vegetables. And fruits and vegetables are very different uh, from a plant point of view and from our point of view. They're, they're just completely different creatures. So, hard to say. So in the positive studies, I found 10 positive studies, but unfortunately none of them controlled for refined carbohydrates. So it's very hard to say whether or not the health benefits that the investigators claimed were due to the vegetables were due to the vegetables or whether they were due to the fact that the people who were eating more fruits and vegetables were eating less refined carbohydrates. And uh, uh, 10 other positive studies unfortunately manipulated more than one variable. So they didn't just add more vegetables to people's diets. They also happen to reduce sodium or reduce saturated fat or um, add exercise, et cetera. So it's just hard to tell which part of the diet was or, or the intervention was responsible for the health benefit. I'm not saying that the vegetables couldn't have been responsible because they could have been. We just can't tell because of the way the studies were designed. So the question is, are vegetables actually good for us or not, or do we just believe or want to believe that they're good for us? And so here are some of the arguments that we, are, that we hear frequently about vegetables and why they may be good for us. And they come down to uh, several ingredients in the, in the vegetables themselves and the argument that vegetarians and vegans in many studies do appear to be healthier in some respects. And so the micronutrient argument um, I'm, is, um, is an interesting one because when you look at it very objectively, much as Dr. Lalonde did beautifully yesterday, you find that animal foods are much more nutritious than plant foods. Not only do they contain more of the things we need, they contain them in a more bioavailable form. 
Um, and, and there are actually, as I'm sure many people here know, certain micronutrients that are not available at all in plant foods. So the next argument is fiber. Uh, and fiber, again, I agree with Dr. Lalonde, that fiber is not a nutrient. We don't absorb it, we don't metabolize it, it is not, it doesn't nourish us in any way. What it seems to do is interfere with the absorption of other things that are probably not good for us. And that may be useful if you're eating things that aren't good for you. So uh, it does seem to reduce appetite, uh, probably because, uh, because it adds bulk. Um, it reduces cholesterol a little bit. We will not go into the, whether or not that's a good thing. Um, and it reduces glycemic index of sweet and starchy foods by about 10 to 20%. We all know that there are more effective ways of doing that than eating fiber. So, but, he, but all of these, uh, uh, when you look at um, the best available evidence uh, right up to the minute in terms of heart disease, cancer, diverticulitis, polyps, and IBS, there's just no evidence to support a role for fiber. And in many cases, there's strong evidence against a role for fiber in any of these conditions. We don't know whether it's effective for weight loss or constipation, yet there just isn't enough uh, evidence available yet for us to be able to figure that out. So, so maybe fiber might not be as good for us as we thought, um, but is it, is it bad for us? And uh, you know, it, I think it depends on the person because the problem with fiber is that we can't digest it, but bacteria love fiber, so they love dining upon fiber, and they will digest the fiber for you. And in the process, they will f ferment the carbohydrates in the fiber, creating gases. And this will not only make you unpopular at parties, but it can also cause significant discomfort for some people. So some people do better on a low fiber diet. So what about the argument that vegetarians and vegans are healthier than people who eat meat? Um, it's, it's very complicated uh, because of the way the studies have been done, but there are certain things that do seem to be true. Vegetarians do have consistently, no matter how the study was done, lower risks of heart disease, a significantly lower risk of heart disease. And they do tend to weigh less, as do vegans, and they do have lower risks of certain cancers and higher risks of others, uh, but primarily lower risks of certain cancers. Um, but they, they die just as much as everybody else does. So, but, but here's the problem with, with this data, is that the vegetarians and vegans, they take better care of themselves in general. And so all of the studies uh, make this very clear. They smoke less, they drink less, they exercise more. We don't know if they eat fewer refined carbohydrates or not because it's usually not mentioned in the studies. So it's really impossible to figure out because vegetarian diets vary so much from one vegetarian to another, much like everybody, much like any omnivore's diet does, it's really hard to know which aspect of the diet is protective. I'm sure we all know people who eat a vegetarian diet who eat very, sort of in a very health conscious way, and people who eat a vegetarian diet who eat a lot of junk food, and they're just not the same diet. So now we're going to go on to a, 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 sort of the meat of the talk, if you will, which is uh, the, the, um, the discussion of antioxidants and plant chemical defense compounds. This is really where vegetables are interesting to me. So, um, part of the problem with studying food is that we tend to, uh, well, researchers anyway, tend to break the food into little parts and then look at it too closely and become completely disoriented about reality. So let's try to undo that. So just some examples of antioxidants. Antioxidants can be uh, various types of compounds. A number of vitamins are antioxidants. Uh, a number of plant compounds here below are antioxidants, just to sort of um, give you some idea of some of the things we're talking about. Um, when JAMA did an excellent review of intervention studies, clinical intervention studies with vitamins A, E, and E, they found that overall, if you supplement people's diets with these vitamins, you actually increase their risk of death. Um, the, vo the vitamin C intervention and selenium, the jury is still out. But notice it doesn't say that they're beneficial. So it's very interesting that um, you know, people who study plants are very well aware of this, that the phytochemicals that we are told are so good for us, these special antioxidant chemicals, they're actually treated by the body as unwanted guests, and we eliminate them very quickly. Um, so rather than go into a discussion about what an antioxidant is and what it does, it's more, I think it's just in the interest of time, better to say that prob it probably doesn't matter because 
even the USDA took down its own uh, internet uh, index list of, um, of uh, compounds, it used to have a list on its site telling you what the antioxidant capacity was of various food compounds, and it turns out that it actually is completely irrelevant, or at least we don't have any evidence telling us that it's important. So how do plants protect themselves? Here are our friends, the crucifers, which we're told are extremely healthy for us, and there are lots of them in the vegetable aisle. Uh, crucifers, uh, broccoli in particular, is very high in one particular uh, compound called sulforaphane, uh, which um, has been shown, it's been studied very extensively. We know a lot about it. Uh, it does help cancer cells to commit suicide. That's what apoptosis means. It inhibits angiogenesis, which is uh, new blood vessel formation, which is how tumors grow. It induces phase two enzymes. These are enzymes within our cells, which are responsible for detoxifying carcinogens. So it's, it sort of upregulates those enzymes, sort of stimulates them and turns them on. So that can be good. If you are eating carcinogens, then you might want to turn these enzymes on a little louder. Uh, these compounds also can reduce H. pylori uh, colonization of the of the stomach, uh, that's a bacteria responsible for ulcers. So, but what is this stuff and why does broccoli make it? So, in, in the broccoli plant sitting in the field, minding its own business, it has within its cells two compounds, one called glucosinolate, another called myrosinase, and they're, they're harmless in and of themselves just sort of sitting there in the plant, but if the broccoli is cut or chewed, then these two compounds mix together and form this uh, sulforaphane, which is an isothiocyanate. There are lots of them in the crucifer family, but we're going to look only at sulforaphane. And what is its job? The broccoli now needs to defend itself from the little creatures that are trying to eat it. It basically is a, a molecule that's designed to kill small living creatures. So what might this mean for us? Um, how does it do it? So the way that these chemicals kill or try to kill these small creatures that are trying to eat it is it, uh, the, the primary way is it poisons their mitochondria. The mitochondria are very important. They're the energy powerhouse of all of our cells. Um, and it also causes all kinds of other uh, problems as well. As you look below, you can see. And, and, in, uh, and in scientific studies, it's been shown that it can kill healthy cells as well as cancerous cells, and it can actually cause cancer itself. So um, what does this mean for you when you're at home eating broccoli? What this means, well, here's some things you might need to know. One is that the glucosinolate, which is the, one of the innocent parent compounds, if you cook or freeze broccoli, uh, you'll reduce the glucosinolate concentration by about 50%. And the enzyme will be the morosinase, the enzyme which uh, works on the glucosinolate, will be completely destroyed. But the bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract have myrosinase activity, so they can act on the remaining glucosinolate and uh, turn it into sulforaphane. And you'll absorb about 75% of that. And then that's rapidly conjugated to our, uh, to a, our intracellular antioxidant glutathione. That's our own intracellular, inside of every one of our cells we have glutathione ready to detoxify things. Glutathione gets rid of sulforaphane as fast as it possibly can. So within three hours, it's all gone. So what happened, what, when you really think about these compounds, which are supposed to be uh, healthy, what we really uh, start to see when we look at various types of vegetable compounds is a mixed message, that these chemicals can be very useful if we're trying to kill things like cancer cells, but they also may be damaging healthy cells. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it, it, it really depends on the person, on how much they absorb, what their enzyme, you know, how fast they detoxify things, and how sensitive they are to various chemicals, and how much of these things they're eating, because the, you know, the dose is very important. So one more vegetable example, and then, then we'll, we'll tie things up. Uh, the nightshades, these three particular nightshades uh, contain within their, within the, um, you know, within these vegetables, you'll find glycoalkaloids. And the glycoalkaloids are, um, they have also been found to have some potential benefits in um, uh, research studies. So they can also, in animals, induce cancer cells to commit suicide. They can kill off bacteria and viruses, and they may have some anti-inflammatory properties. But what does the glycoalkaloid do for the 
potato, for example. We're going to look at the potato glycoalkaloids in particular because the, not only because they're the best studied, but they're the most potent. Um, the glycoalkaloids in, other, in the other um, nightshades are, are either weak or very low concentrations. So these are designed as pesticides. They're cholinesterase inhibitors, which is a, it's a neurotoxin. Uh, nerve gas works exactly the same way. Um, and uh, they burst membranes open because they bind so strongly to cholesterol that it destabilizes the membrane of living cells. So that's how they try to kill invaders, how the potato tries to protect itself. Um, and so in animal studies, there's lots of data about um, animals becoming sick and gravely ill uh, when they are exposed to high doses of glycoalkaloids or feed that is very high in glycoalkaloids. However, in human studies, we don't see a lot of problems. In fact, there was a very nice, nicely done dose escalation study that showed you have to eat enough glycoalkaloid to the equivalent of 27 potatoes worth of glycoalkaloid to even feel sick to your stomach. So that's reassuring. Um, and, uh, but, but, but it is a known toxin, and the, the, um, uh, the federal government limits how much uh, solanine, which is the name of the glycoalkaloid in potato, the federal government limits how much, glyco how much solanine can be in potatoes that go to market. Um, and as they're, you know, as they're traveling, as they're being um, transported and stored and so forth, the glycoalkaloid, um, the solanine content can rise. There, the solanine is completely indestructible by cooking. You can't cook it away. You can't fry it away. And in fact, if you fry potatoes over and over in the same oil, they will actually concentrate the solanine. Um, you can't digest them away. They're, they're really hearty. Uh, but the good news is they're very poorly absorbed by most people. So um, you know, if you don't eat them too often, you're probably OK. And, uh, but the, they do have a very long half-life. If you eat them very frequently, they can build up over time. But the good news is because almost all of the solanine is in the peel of the potato. If you peel the potato, you've removed almost all the solanine. But of course, then you've removed the part that everybody tells us is the best for us. So again, we have with, with uh, glycoalkaloids mixed messages. They are potentially toxic, but they're also potentially beneficial. It depends on the dose. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on the person. Um, and uh, it, 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 they're, they're just not good at uh, differentiating between cancer cells and other types of cells, so we have to be careful. And just to give you a little taste of a few other vegetables, because in the interest of time, we can't go through every group, uh, there'll be a lot of information about vegetables and all kinds of foods on my website in several weeks. But for now, just suffice it to say that the same pattern uh, emerges when you look at onions and garlic, and also when you look at the, the capsaicinoids of, of, the, of peppers. These are all double-edged swords. And so the question is, what do we do with all of this information? Um, it's important to realize, again, the circumstances, uh, you know, the, the dose makes the poison. If you're not eating too much of these things or if you're not sensitive, you have a healthy gastrointestinal system, a healthy immune system, you're probably going to be okay with, with whole vegetables not concentrates or extracts or isolated compounds from vegetables, but whole vegetables. We've been eating vegetables for millions of years. So most of us have adapted to be able to deal with, and you can see just by the way the body deals with the sulforaphane from broccoli, how quickly it eliminates it. We, you know, we are very well protected against these compounds in most cases. But there are some people who don't do well with certain vegetables, and this may be because there's some compromise in, in our natural barriers along the way as we get older or become exposed to certain environmental toxins or who knows why. So for some people, this may be a delicious lunch. And for other people, it may be a nightmare waiting to happen. And, uh, so, and for, for some people, they may need to lean more, especially if you're very sensitive, have a lot of food sensitivities, you may need to lean more in the direction of animal foods rather than plant foods. It depends on, on who you are. Because animal foods, if this is your lunch, uh, you do not need to deal with chemicals. You need to deal with fangs and claws and growling and being chased and perhaps even being eaten. Uh, so if you, but the problem is, uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it really, but my point really is not to malign vegetables. It's just to open our minds about vegetables and think about them more, you know, sort of more objectively. And for each person to do their own individual experiments with vegetables because, uh, you know, for example, if you look on the internet and you type in nightshades, 
you're going to get all kinds of stories of people who have pain with nightshades, for example. But if you look in the literature, the scientific literature, you won't find anything. So it's just, and you, and you, you shouldn't wait for people to do those studies. You can do them on your own very easily, um, just by knowing a little bit about the different uh, compounds and various uh, vegetables that you eat. Um, so it, it's really important because for some people, these vegetables are really very easy to tolerate and uh, make up a perfectly healthy diet. I'm, a, in general, a huge fan of the paleo diet. But it, for there are some people who do need to modify it um, based, on, based on their own individual sensitivities. Um, and you know, so in, in closing, I just wanted to say that it may be that vegetables appear so healthy in all of the epidemiological studies because of what they are not and not because of what they are. It could be simply that vegetables are better for us because it helps us eat less of less of less donut, fewer donuts. Uh, who knows exactly why? Um, but uh, you know, it's really important, I think, just to keep an open mind about these things. And um, be happy to answer any questions. If anybody has any? All right, so there is time for some questions, but the author's event will be in this room in about 10 minutes. So anybody who is sitting at a table right now, can you please not sit at the table and clear any of your things off of that table? So question time. Hi. Hi, I was wondering, uh, you started to talk a little bit about fiber and gut um, bacteria needing to eat it. But I know that the gut is very essential to having a good immune system, and it's important that we are able to feed the gut microbes. So how do you propose, I mean, so I would think that would be a benefit, a benefit to vegetables, is to be able to feed the gut bacteria that helps our immune system. It, it does make sense in theory, although we just have a lot of examples of peoples around the world who have been able to eat, somehow thrive without plant matter in their diet. And so I, I don't know. If I don't know how to answer the question except to say that there are good examples, you know, in the world that 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 argue otherwise. I'm not sure what the answer is to be honest, but I can't imagine, given those examples, that fiber is necessary. Although fiber might be helpful under certain circumstances, depending on what else you're eating. Well, it might not be the fiber, but it could be other things. Right. I, again, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer. To be completely honest with you, I just know that there are people who have lived a long life without any fiber. So it's just interesting to think about. Hi, uh, Hi. my name is David. Hi, I just David. had a quick question, also about the fiber. And you said that you know we can't extract the energy, but isn't the truth that from soluble fiber we can our gut bacteria can produce uh, short chain fatty acids, and those can have beneficial effects for our metabolism? and on uh, inflammation? Yes, although there are other ways to get short-chain fatty acids. And so, um, you know, it, I, I don't want to pretend that I am a, a gut microbial expert, because I'm not. And I haven't looked at the literature about, about gut microbes. So I, I can't answer these types of questions in the amount of detail that I would want to be okay. able to. Yeah, I was, uh, what I've been reading about specifically was butyric acid. And the ways you can get that are from, uh, you know, gut bacteria production, but also from dairy products. So if we're looking at a more ancestral approach, I think plant fiber might be a better source. Hmm. And that's something I want to get your opinion on, is I understand that the polyphenols and like those things, they might not be directly helpful, but what do you think about some people who say they could be helpful through hormesis and like building up a tolerance to them? Oh, right. So, so um, the polyphenols, which are... Most of the polyphenols that have been studied in the literature are, 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 uh, are studied in fruits. And so the, the nice thing about polyphenols, that the vast majority of them anyway, are much more benign compounds because they're, they're, they're mostly pigments. And pigments are not, they're not designed by the plant to be toxic. The plant wants you to eat its fruit. And so it's a completely different category from vegetables to think about a lot of the, the pigmented polyphenols. All right, well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you mentioned that the plant wants uh, its fruits to be eaten, but not its structure, and that seems to make a lot of sense to me. I was expecting maybe to go into a little bit more detail on that. Uh, most of the vegetables that have fruits, I guess, are the nightshades, right? The tomatoes and peppers. So what's better to eat? What's worse to eat? Oh, that's such a good question. I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot to mention the nightshades are an interesting exception because many of them, as you notice, they are fruits. They do have seeds. Right. 
And so, for example, the uh, red peppers, if we had had more time, uh, red peppers are, um, you know, uh, the, the spicy peppers, for example, we're not really supposed to eat those, but certain birds enjoy them very much. And it turns out that birds are much better at dispersing the seeds than we are. And so the plant has gone out of its way to attract the birds, but to repel us. Um, and so it's a very interesting question because there's some fruits that are poisonous. Many berries, many types of berries and so forth are poisonous. So I don't know. It's a, it's a really good question why some fruits, and it may be j just be that the plant is trying to attract certain types of predators to disperse its seeds. So what would be some of the human uh, symbiotic, you know, predators or, you know, cooperative agents for, for plants? You know, I mean, tomatoes, does that fit into, there's not too many plants I can really think of that, you know, you're just eating the fruit except for fruits. Well, I think it so, depends. I mean, again, I'm not saying that eating plants is bad. Yeah, I'm I just know. saying that if we're aware of what's in them, it can help certain people with certain symptoms. Um, but if you don't, it's a crapshoot because you, you have no idea what the effect is on some of those slides that seem to say it might hurt, it might help. We don't know at this point. Well, I think my point is that I don't see any strong evidence that says that it helps a healthy person. As far as I can tell, and it, and it may just be, just because the science hasn't proved to us that vegetables are healthy doesn't mean they're not healthy. It just means the science isn't there yet. Um, and so I was just opening up the possibility that perhaps these compounds are really only irritants that we've had to evolve to deal with because we happen to eat them, and maybe not that they're actually good for us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, one last question. You mentioned potatoes peeling the skin. Uh, if you peel them after you cook them, are you still getting rid of all of the anti-nutrients, or is it best to peel them before? In other words, if you bake a sweet potato, are you baking that stuff into the potato? Well, a sweet potato is not a potato. Well, a sweet potato and white potato are different. So right. a, a white potato is a nightshade, but a sweet potato is not. Right. And so, and I haven't seen any studies where they've, bo you know, it, it, I don't know about boiling the potato, whether some of the solanine gets into the water of the, of the, the you know, the right. boiled water. I don't know. So the white potato has the solanine, but the sweet potato has the oxalates and other things in it also, right? In right. Every vegetable has its little, um, has its way of, t of protecting itself. Okay. Thanks. Hi. We were talking about how phytonutrients are eliminated from the body quickly. And one way of thinking that uh, about phyto phytonutrients might be that you eat a vast array of phytonutrients and the body picks and chooses what it wants and eliminates the things it's not using. So in those studies that identified the elimination of the phytonutrients, did they actually look at the proportion of which phytonutrients were eliminated compared to what was taken in? So that you might see if there was a discrepancy you mean indicating selective absorption of phytonutrients? Mm. Do you mean between different, comparing different vegetable phytonutrients or looking at one specific phytonutrient? Well, no, I mean, there's a, there isn't any one phytonutrient. I mean, you, there are usually a lot of phytonutrients. Right, phytonutrient so just means plant chemical. Right. Phyto just so, means plant. So on one day, you might, your biochemistry might need the assistance of A, C, and E, and on other days it might need B and D, and so you might selectively retain the ones you need for whatever biochemical metabolic challenge you're facing that day. And so if you just say that some of them are eliminated, does that prove that they're all eliminated? And do oh, the studies no. look at that? No, the studies do not, do not even ask that question. Right. Exactly. The, and the studies have a lot of limitations, absolutely, yeah. and that's not a question that I would, that I... So, I mean, it just can't say that just because they're eliminated that they're all eliminated and you didn't use any of them. No, uh, but so far, the, the ones that have been studied very extensively from very familiar, the very familiar plant chemicals that have been studied extensively, I come across the same pattern over and over again, the sort of the same phrases come up time and time again, the mixed messages, the double-edged sword, the depends on the condition, depends on the dose, can't discriminate. I come up, you know, across a wide variety of plant compounds, so it's just interesting to think about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.